Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ira Stanton Sr. I am the moderator this afternoon. Let's get a couple of ground rules set up. Number one, please turn your cell phones off. Don't put them on vibrators. Unless you're a doctor on a call. Also, uh, the restrooms are to the door and to the right. If you need to go there, and uh, there will be no questions from the floor. Questions will be already taken care of already. Right? We're in for a lively time tonight, and Flint has some decisions to make, and we want you to hear from both of the candidates. Not what somebody told you, but speak from the horse's mouth. I have to tell them like sometimes you just speak for that so that's where we are, okay? Uh, we're going to have a welcome and opening prayer by Deacon uh, Michael Deer, and then uh, uh, we're going to have the purpose and ground rules, which I just covered with you, pretty much. Uh, also, on the forum, if you do any questions, answer, ask some questions. It's such a thing that adopted. Raise your hand. And she'll be asking questions. Peace. Opponent will have two minutes to answer the question. Uh, flip the coin in the back, and uh, Dr. Weaver will go first to answer the question. No, she lost. <laughs> Dr. Wall, Dr. Weaver. There, I, I didn't have to speak there this morning. I was on site in the cold trying to do an interview, and you got to sleep. Uh, so give me a break. All right, we're going to have uh, Deacon Michael Deer, who is uh, over the uh, church here, to come up and give us our welcome and opening prayer. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of St. Michael's Catholic Church and Michigan Faith in Action, I would like to I would like to welcome you to this mayoral candidates forum. Just a little side note, Father Tom Blairstone wants to be here, but he's in Lansing talking about the finances of the parish. So he asked me as the caretaker of the parish to take over for him this evening. I don't know if I can do as well a job as him, but I just want to thank you all so very much for coming here and allowing us to host this. We feel honored here at St. Michael's. I was working at early this afternoon, I was trying to figure out the scripture passage to begin with this afternoon. And um, hope seems to be the word that a lot of people think about here and wish and hope we have here in the city of Flint. So I've got a scripture passage from chapter 29 of Jeremiah, verse 11. For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for woe. Plans to give you a future full of hope. When you call me, when you go to pray for me, I will listen to you. When you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, you will find me in your youth, says the Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit down upon the city. We pray that you bless each and every person that lives within the city. We ask you to fill them with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and gift of patience. We are called here tonight to interview these candidates, to find out the position on many, many issues here that face this city. We all have hope that one day we will be the city that we once was. Mayor Dane Wally and Dr. Karen Weaver have a major task ahead of them. We pray that you respect their opinions this evening. We pray that you pray about their answers. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, fill you with his love, and help you make the decision that is right for the city of Flint. We pray that let us be open-minded. Fill your ever-presence, Lord, in Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Help us to be the city of Flint that we all want to be. We pray all of these things in your loving and glorious name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, when we look today, the purpose of this forum is to educate the community on the various positions of the campus will and have already taken. To hear their vision and game plan for current community challenges, and most importantly, to encourage a strong voter turnout on election day, November 3rd, 2015. As I stated previously, the candidates will have two minutes to respond to each question. Candidates were, were provided all questions that will be asked tonight, so they had time to look at them and think about them and come up with their answers. We don't like to surprise people on the last minute. And for the sake of time, we will not receive all your questions. Uh, as I said, I'm so Kenyatta Dotson, who is on the school board, and also a Michigan Faith and Action board member, uh, and myself will be asking the questions. So I'd like to right now introduce, uh, present to some, because of his position in the present over Mayor Johnny Pauley. Thank you, Pastor, <clears throat> and I do want to say good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks to St. Michael's for hosting us and Michigan Faith in Action for putting this forum together. Uh, we're starting on a very serious topic. Uh, we all recognize that... We all recognize that, that Flint has to have safe water. I've made the re recommendation for us to reconnect to Detroit because that's the fastest way that we can bring the additional corrosion control into our system and stabilize our water. We have to also address the long-term challenges with lead. Uh, this has been devastating for our community. The cost to reconnect to Detroit is $12 million worked very hard to put together a partnership. I want to thank especially the uh, City Council for their support. Uh, I'm thankful to God for the focus and determination to deal with this most challenging issue that I've faced in six years in office. Uh, we also have to replace 15,000 lead service lines across our community. I'm in discussions with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency about using revolving loan funds to cover the full line replacement, both on the private as well as the public side. Now, I have a comprehensive plan to improve our water. Uh, we have to look to partners to provide our funding so we can keep our costs on our local customers as low as possible. And we have to keep pressing and fighting for the state, which put us in this difficult position to provide the resources that we need. My request to Governor Snyder total $45 million. So far, we've seen a pledge of six, and previously we had two. So we have a very long way to go to get the support that we need, and I'll continue to work towards that goal. Thank you. Uh, 
Dr. Weaver, in light of the text, several quotes being raised regarding the American Explosive Effect, do you have a figure on what it would take to correct this issue throughout Flint? And what resources will you pursue to make it safer and faster to correct it to this issue? Okay, thank you very much. And, you know, I also want to thank St. Michael's and Michigan Faith in Action for hosting this forum. And I want to thank the audience for coming out and listening as well. I'm really happy to be here and share my thoughts and ideas about the issues facing our city. Um, the first thing I want to do uh, as mayor <clears throat> is meet personally with my congressional delegation. We need to have Flint declared as a federal disaster area because we need some federal funds to help us fix this mess that we're in. You know, right now, we're faced, we're, we're faced with the largest public health and infrastructure crisis that Flint has ever witnessed, that we've ever seen. And this happened on, 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 your, on your watch. You know, so the response is gonna require something beyond the capacity of the city. It's going to require beyond the capacity of the state. And so what I wanna do is appeal to federal level and work with the congressional delegation to get Flint declared as a disaster area because that's what we're going to have to have to fix this. We've heard a lot of different figures from different sources. We've heard 50 million. We've heard 350 million. We've even heard uh, Virginia Tech tell us it could be $1.5 billion. We don't know what it's going to cost us to fix this because we've never seen or experienced a, a disaster or a catastrophe like what we're facing in the city of Flint today. And it's a result of switching from the lake water to, to the Flint River water. But that's what I'm going to do, is I'm gonna reach out. I wanna work at the federal level because we need those kinds of dollars to fix our infrastructure. We need to bring those kinds of dollars in the city of Flint to help us get this situation under hand. Thank you. Okay, first I want to say that I'm going to have engagement with, with the federal resources. That's going to be a priority of my administration to hire consultants with the best technical expertise because that's what we're going to have to have. But as far as public engagement, uh, of course we're going to reach out with the local news media. We're going to do radio, public access. Uh, we're in the digital age. We've got to utilize social media as a way to get information out to the public. Newsletters. We've even talked about a mobile city hall. Um, but one thing that we need to do is the good old-fashioned town hall meetings. That's how I want to reach out. I want to talk with people. And I think this is so important that I'm willing to commit to do a town hall meeting once a month my first year in office. That's what I want to do. We, we, we've got to do this because the trust has been broken. Trust has been broken and the community has to be reassured. And the only way the community is going to be reassured is to have that uh, where we can sit and talk. They can hear what I have to say, what my administration has to say. I can hear their concerns. They have an opportunity to voice them. And um, we need to have that kind of communication. It needs to be that regular once a month. Uh, because those are the things that have been missing. That's how you're open. That's how you're honest. That's how you're transparent. And that's how you restore hope. And that's how you restore faith as you're working with the community and you're talking with them on a, on a regular basis. That's what I want to have happen. And, and also you asked about, um, let's see, uh, providing accurate updates. I think we have to have continuous aggressive monitoring of our water system. That has to be in place. That, wasn't, that was not in place. That's, that's part of the reason we're in this mess. We didn't have that continuous aggressive monitoring of our water system. 
If we'd been doing that, we wouldn't be facing these issues that we're facing now. Thank you. Do I have to remind you again? Hold your applause to the end. Mayor Wall the same question. Thank you. Um, public engagement really starts with our, with our city council. And that's the major difference with where we are now versus what we had to deal with under the emergency manager, where there weren't even council meetings for these public discussions to take place. That's the place where you as the public get to see the action items that are on the city's agenda, where you have the opportunity to comment on those agenda items. So you saw last night a strong partnership with city council to support the pledge that the city needed to make to bring in the $10 million that we need to pay the bill for Detroit over the next nine months while we work towards the new pipeline that our community will, will co-own. To understand my approach around public engagement, I'd like you to look at what we accomplished with the comprehensive master plan. Because despite an emergency manager being in place, we had over three years 300 meetings, and we had 5,000 citizens involved. We were in churches, neighborhood associations, we were engaging people all across the city in meaningful dialogue based on information that was provided. And that's key. You have to have meaningful information so the community can be a part of making decisions and guiding decisions. There are flaws in the state laws around public notification with water. We've learned that. And I've asked that our legislators and governor work to change that in state law so that we're not only going above and beyond in our own community to provide monthly operating reports and quarterly reports, but that those reports would be available in the case of water to this community or other communities across the state, even when an emergency manager is in place because public engagement and transparency, it can't be the choice of one individual. It has to be the standard all across our community. Thank you. Last question to you, directed to you, uh, Mayor Wally. How will you ensure the use of the best technical expertise is involved in all strategies with correcting the issue? Yeah. Yeah. We, we have to have the, the best experts in the country working with us, whether it's on water, or public safety or blight, any of the challenges that we face. Even when we had the emergency manager, I reached out directly to the White House, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, and asked for a direct line of contact for our community because we didn't want to only be dealing with the state and the Department of Environmental Quality. And the White House assigned to us as our liaison, uh, Dr. Susan Hedman, who's the regional administrator for EPA's region over this state. Uh, she's also the director of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and she's a, a direct appointee of President Obama. Uh, her and I have been in regular communication. They've offered us their best experts, first on TTHM. Uh, now we have their best experts out of their Cincinnati Water Lab on corrosion control and water distribution and the lead and copper rule. Those resources are at the table. And those individuals were part of the recommendation that finally moved Governor Snyder to come to Flint for the first time in our water crisis to actually come here and pledge support to this community and admit that the Department of Environmental Quality and the mistakes that were made and begin to put us on a corrective action path. There is much more that has to be done at the federal level, at the state level, and right here in our own community. It's going to take all of us working together on this. Uh, but I'm very proud of the close working relationship I've had with the President and the White House team. And we will continue to use every resource that's available to us on water, on blight, on neighborhood stabilization and economic development. Uh, we have that technical resource. And we have great resources right here in our own community through the Greater Flint Health Coalition, Hurley Medical Center. Uh, those experts are already at the table with the Safe Drinking Water Task Force. Dr. Weaver, same question. How will you ensure that you have the best technical expertise is involved in all strategies for correcting this issue? Okay. 
Well, let me say again that engagement with, with uh, federal resources is going to be a priority. We have to have the best technical assistance and experts to help us fix this. Uh, we, we have to. We need them here with us right now. Yes, we do have uh, some of them are at the table. Some of them are at the, at the table and they spoke out. And they, they spoke out and that's why we got the help that we needed because our medical community here in Flint spoke out. That's what had to happen. Virginia Tech had been here and they spoke out on it. So that's when the, the state came and decided to say, okay, we're going to do something. They should do something. They owe it to us. So we need FEMA. We need the Army Corps of Engineers here. That's the kind of expertise we need. They're responsible for investigating and developing and maintaining the nation's water. You know, so, so we need that kind of help. We need proven expertise. You know, they've been around for a long time and they have a proven track record. That's what we have to have happen. We need those kinds of resources because that's what's going to help to bring back the trust factor. That's, you know, that's, the city and the state have let us down there. They've let us down as far as the trust factor goes. So we need those kinds of experts to come in and let us know what's going on. We don't need uh, people playing blame, blame games. We need people to step up, give us the information that we need to have so we can do what we need to do to correct this problem. That's what we need because we're talking about the lives of people. We're talking about you. We're talking about me. We're talking about your children and my children and your grandparents and, and, and your aunts and your uncles and your brothers. We're talking about people's lives here. So it's not time for us to pass the buck. We need to bring the experts here. We will have them here at the table with us. I will work tirelessly and effortlessly for that. We want to make sure that happens. We're going to have the people that we trust. We're going to keep the people that have been at the table giving us the correct information, and we're going to continue to reach out and bring whoever we need to bring to the table to help us get this situation corrected, because it needs to be fixed now. It doesn't need to be fixed later. It needs to be fixed now. So that's what I'll be doing. I'm going to talk about crime. Sadly, too many Flint residents feel unsafe in their home and walking in their neighborhood. And our children are troubled by the fear of violence and crime as they walk to school. City leadership must join forces with others to change this narrative reality for our city. Therefore, Mayor Wallen, in light of the escalating number of homicides occurring in the city and no concrete plan to reduce violence using nationwide best practices, how will the military administration move forward with local, state, and national partners to reverse this trend on a sustainable basis? Is it Dr. Weaver's turn to go first, or? Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Weaver's back on you. Oh, that's I fine. I want to give a shot. Okay. Uh, first, let me say this. We need police. We, we, we know that. We know we need police. But we also need engaged, active, community, you know, citizens. We need that to help this. And so one of the things that I've always talked about was community policing. We need to bring community policing back to the city of Flint. It's a, it's a, a national program. It's a best practice. And it's been done here in Flint. It was proven right here in Flint. So we need to look at that and bring that back. I want to say that first of all. But, to, but in order to reverse the trend of escalating homicides occurring in the city of Flint, one thing that we're going to have to do is take more seriously the complaints that our residents make. We've got to take those seriously. We have over 10,000 complaints. They're unresolved complaints. So once again, the trust has been broken. We have over 10,000 unresolved complaints stuck in the detective bureau. And, and, and some of them are ready for warrants to be issued. So the residents have been speaking up. They've been telling on people, like the alleged killer of George, the store owner. That's an example. There had been a previous B&E complaint on Baltimore. The person had taken a flat screen TV, and the neighbor was willing to testify. So whether we use blue badge volunteers or church members, you know, we've got these 10,000 or more complaints have to be sorted out. They have to be sorted out and they need to be prioritized and, and that should have been done yesterday. 
You know, you look and see what happened when we had a TNT brought cold case to Flint. We found over 400 rape kits that were sitting in the evidence room. When that happened, they were processed and some of those rapists were arrested. So we also need additional uh, undercover officers. We need detectives. I'd like to do some covert hiring and employ, you know, employ them. Put them in our neighborhoods that are troubled. We have homes there. We have houses that they can live in. That could be part of an incentive, part of a package to get them here in the city and make our neighborhoods safe, make things start happening. We've got to treat uh, B&Es and robberies differently. We need to treat them like you treat homicides. So instead of issuing a complaint, you know, having a complaint and giving them a complaint number, we need to do some sweeps. We need to be looking for fingerprints. We need to treat these more seriously. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Same question, Marijuana. Flint's safety is my absolute number one top priority with crime, with water, and we do have a plan to reduce gun violence and crime in our community. Uh, one of the things that's unique about our adopted comprehensive plan is that there's an entire chapter dedicated to public safety, health, and welfare. And it has a focus on uh, youth, and it also has a focus on community engagement. By youth, I mean youth development and positive engagement with our youth. Um, the violent crime rate in Flint uh, has been coming down the last few years since its peak. And it's taken a lot of hard work from the community, uh, from our men and women in uniform who put them, their lives on the line every single day for us. Tragically, we are seeing a rise of homicides this year, uh, but we do still see a long-term downward trend in that. And, and that's important because the efforts that we're all making at the community level, within our own Flint Police Department, the state police, the federal law enforcement partners, there are a number of innovative approaches that are being taken. Uh, the city's piloting community policing in Atherton East as part of the Choice Neighborhoods Program. The reality is we don't have an officer to put in every neighborhood, but we're putting it in a place where we think we can save lives and make a difference, and then use that to go out and gain additional resources to replicate that in other parts of the city. We have federal law enforcement, the FBI and the DEA, sitting down with the Flint Police Department every week and identifying the highest priority offenders so those individuals are off the streets and our communities are safer. We're going to have a whole new toolbox for our community through the U.S. Department of Justice's Violence Reduction Network that the City of Flint was just invited into uh, with Chief Tolbert's leadership, and that was announced in Detroit. I also want to say that I'm a strong advocate for gun safety laws because we have to get illegal guns off the street and out of the hands of those criminals who intend to do our community harm. Thank you, Mayor the next question is, in the 2012 village election, 6.5 zones were requested to maintain the staffing levels in the police and fire department. In that same time period, violence and crime escalated, and the plant by crime process was essentially abandoned. So what future communication steps will your administration take to ensure no misunderstanding on the use of village funds for safety and violence reduction? I want to first say thank you to everybody who has supported the village and who put our community in this position. Because when we faced the difficult situation that the emergency manager was putting us in, those dedicated millage funds were critical for putting police officers and firefighters on the job. Today we have more than 50 of our men and women in uniform coming to work for us because of that dedicated millage. And since the emergency manager has left, we've been able to make some positive changes in adding to our force, uh, utilizing the new opportunity to have part-time officers for dedicated assignments like in the community education program that's going into our schools. We ne definitely need to do more to communicate with the public. This is your money that's being invested in our community's public safety. And you need to understand not just the millage fund, but also the city's general fund which covers the, most of the rest of the public safety budget and how all of those dynamics work together. You know, I have experience with our budget. I understand how we can make the most of the limited resources that we do have. And when it comes to the Lifelines program, I was there at the beginning when that got started. 
And a lot of people in this room came together around that approach. I am committed, now that we're back in local control, of finding the resources to revitalize that program. Well, the emergency manager had cut the Human Relations Commission, and that staff director had been providing the support to the program. I'm committed to working with you to figure that out and using the resources in the violence reduction network like they did in Detroit to bring in grant dollars for those community-based approaches to violence prevention. Thank you. You know what, um, when that 2012 millage was promoted, uh, when, when we voted on that, it was promoted differently. It was touted as a way to hire additional police officers. That's what people were told. That's how it was sold to us, that we were going to get more. Everybody that I've talked with in the community has said, we thought we were getting more police officers. We thought we were getting more fire. They thought we were gonna get larger numbers for public safety. That's what, what it was touted to, to, to sell to the public. It wasn't talked about uh, maintaining staffing levels. You know, that must have been in the, the fine print because nobody that I've spoken with, and I've been speaking to people every single day, has said that's what they thought that millage was for. So it was sold to us a different way. So once again, the public trust was compromised. It was broken, and that has to be restored. So we've got to do what we tell the voters we're going to do. That's the problem. We, we aren't going to be able to pass another millage for public safety based on the record that was in place before because nobody's going to believe it. People are still asking what happened to the money? Where are the police officers that we thought we were going to get when we voted for the millage? So I want to I want to bring that back. I want to restore that trust. I want to restore that confidence because leadership accountability and trustworthiness are essential. That's how you're going to get the masses of people to follow you and, and do that vote if it comes back up. So I want to be transparent and I want to be open in, in regaining the trust of the community at City Hall. So if I tell you I'm going to spend a dollar for A, that's what I'm going to spend that dollar for. And that's where those, those uh, monthly town hall meetings will come in handy because that's when you have a chance to talk with the community and let them know what you're doing and explain to them how you're setting things up and get their involvement in what it is you want to do. That's what those will help with. That's how you're, you're transparent. That's how you buy uh, back the trust of the community. That's how you get them to want to follow you. We have to do what we tell the voters we're going to do with the money, not something else. Thank you, Dr. You can keep the mic. The last question of the crime is within the first 60 days of your administration, will you develop a quarterly town hall meeting feedback and listening process to ensure that you are hearing and addressing the neighborhood safety issues important to MSA as well as my residents? Well, uh, yes, I will. Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm smiling because you were talking about a quarterly and I'm trying to up it because I think we need more than quarterly with everything that's going on in the city, with the way things are, with the troubles and the challenges and the issues that we're facing. Yes, I want to do a monthly town hall meeting for that. In fact, I would hope that uh, MFA would sponsor some of those with me because I can't do it alone. The administration can't do it alone. I'm looking to build partnerships and collaborate with other entities that are out there in the city of Flint. We have to do this work together. It's going to take all of us to make these changes come about. So yeah, my, that's the only way I can do what my ambition is, which is to restore the, the faith and the hope and the trust back in the community. I hope that block club uh, members are there. I hope block club presidents are there. I want them there to talk with me about how we're going to move the city forward because we find ourselves in this position in the city because of lack of town hall meetings and lack of community involvement. That's been the big problem. We haven't had those. That 35% that illegal increase of the water, that wouldn't have happened uh, if we'd been having community town hall meetings and we'd been talking with people and letting them know. That's, that's what that prevents. So yeah, I want to have the, the uh, town hall meetings. I have no problem doing it.
I have no problem doing it. So yes. Thank you, Dr. Same question, everyone. Flint's, Flint's a very active community. Uh, I'd be happy to work with MFA on quarterly town hall meetings. Um, we can do those as often as you like. Uh, this organization and its predecessor have invited me on a number of occasions to come and be part of sessions, and, and you know my record. Uh, I show up, I make commitments, and we do uh, what we pledge to do. When I first came into office six years ago, when we were at the bottom of the recession, we started a neighborhood action plan. We didn't have one grant dollar for that when we started. We went out to every ward, then we came back and did three more working sessions in every ward, and we laid the groundwork for that comprehensive planning process. Town hall meetings have a, have a place, um, but I don't want it to just be about city officials. It, it has to be a partnership, and we've got to have working meetings, and we've got to have task forces that actually get work done, because you know, city council doors are open. We have that dialogue multiple times a month. What we need to do in this community is we need to take action. We need to solve problems. My office door has been open to this community since the day you elected me. And I take those conversations with this community very seriously. I learned from those conversations that we had. But we'll need to work together to implement change. We've had hundreds of citizens involved in the master planning process. First they were advisory groups, and then after the plan got adopted, they became implementation task force groups. And many of our concerned citizens, our university experts, have been at the table working with us. One thing I'd like to know from Dr. Weaver is, how many of our master planning sessions did she attend? When we did that critical work in this community to put a comprehensive plan in place for the first time in 50 years, was she involved? When we go back and look at the millage that was voted in 2012, that millage is weighted and this is for the people more than anything else. We need to make sure we just repeat what we're voting for. It said safety and fire millage. That's all it said. We voted for it. The emergency manager used that money for, for safety. Instead of paying for 15 police, he paid for 26. Okay, so, so, I'm out Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got information from you. We move on to schools. Uh, the district school is facing serious deficit and performance issues causing our son students to continue to lose ground academically when compared to others on local, state, and national levels. As a community, we must work together using innovative and proven approaches to close this performance gap. Giving our children the greatest opportunity to succeed in the global job fair. Therefore, within the first 60 days of your administration, will you convene a series of meetings involving teachers, parents, and students with Flint school officials to discover points of collaboration and partnership on issues affecting the learning environment uh, in our school. First question goes to you, Dr. Weaver. Okay, you know, the, the, the schools are very important to me uh, because that's where our kids are, and kids has always been a priority of mine. So I'm looking forward to working with the schools. But first, I want to be clear before I answer something, that the Flint School District is a separate, sovereign, governmental unit, and it operates with its own elected board of directors. It does that. So I can't impose anything on the Flint schools. And I also recognize that we have other schools besides the community schools. We have charter schools that are out there as well. So will I reach out to them? I sure will. I'll reach out to them because I want to see where we can line up our resources, where we can partner and where we can collaborate and make things happen. Because for too long, the public entities have operated in silos and we need to break down those barriers. We need to break down those walls. So I want to reach out to the schools. 
you know, under my leadership, I think that's exactly what we need to have, have happen because we're all in this together. So when we're looking at what creates the, the learning environment, we have to have jobs for the parents. So I want to reach out to the Regional Chamber of Commerce. There has to be excellent education. So yeah, I'm going to reach out to all the public schools in the city. There has to be adequate housing for people to stay in that live by these schools. So I'm going to reach out to the Landlord Association and the Realtors because our children come first. So I'm going to do whatever I have to do uh, to work together with the schools. That's something that I've done a lot of. I have a lot of experience working with the schools and forming partnerships and bringing services not only to the children but to the, uh, to the parents of these kids, to the neighborhoods around these schools. So I'm looking forward to working with the schools and collaborating with them. And I want to say that I would like to be one of, you know, working with the superintendent and whoever I need to to make those kinds of things happen. To, to your question specifically, I, I want to say yes. Uh, we, we need great schools to truly rebuild Flint. Uh, I'm committed to working to create more opportunities for our children and our youth. And as a father of young children who are school age, I, I see that every single day. Um, it's not a surprise to me that my opponent, uh, Candidate Weaver, wouldn't be aware of how the city and the schools are working together because she hasn't been at the table. Uh, if she would have come to one of our master planning steering committee meetings, she would have seen that all of the superintendents have been at the table, the Flint School Board has been at the table, and we made a commitment when we received that planning money from President Obama's Sustainable Communities Program that the schools would be a central partner with the community. Th this is not something that is, is going to be done in the future. It's always something we can improve on, and I'm committed to doing that. We've had a partnership over the last year to reestablish community education in the city of Flint, because I've heard from you, thank you, over and over, that the number one thing we can do between the city and the schools is to reestablish community education. And did you think you would see the day when we would have the Mott Foundation funding community education again with the Crim Fitness Foundation and the city of Flint bringing a million dollar grant from the Corporation for National Community Service to put 40 AmeriCorps members into those schools. We're going to change lives with the partnership that we have in place. Schools are going to become hubs of neighborhoods again. And kids in this community are going to be given a real chance to succeed. That's not something that's going to happen in the future. That's something that's happening now in our community. And we're going to expand that model to every school in the city of Flint and bring in the universities and bring in partners. So we're back to being the world-class education system that Flint was known as. That's already been adopted in our comprehensive plan because this community sees it as a priority. I recognize it and I'm working tirelessly to implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question back to Mayor Wong. Moreover, within the same time frame, will you appoint a higher ranking member of your cabinet to be your latest honor, perhaps chief of education on areas of cooperation concerning our principles? I will work to do that. I think you know that when I first came into office, I had the ability to appoint a governmental policy director. And I chose an individual, a senior administrator, with the Flint Community Schools to come and serve in that position, David Solis. Uh, unfortunately, that position was eliminated uh, by the Flint City Council as we faced our, our budget challenges. And since that time, I've done everything possible personally, myself, to make sure that the Flint schools were involved in that comprehensive planning process, that I was at the table, at the steering committee, making decisions about re-implementing community education. So it, it's something that I'd like to do, but I don't know the budget capacity that we'll have. There, there certainly could be a, a lead staff person, um, but our department heads are also working so hard. I mean, take the chief of police. Uh, Chief Tolbert's been involved in the community education work. Uh, we just got through City Council last night the budget amendment to be able to have a part-time officer assigned to every one of those community school locations. But Chief Tolbert has an awful lot on his plate, and, and I don't think I can ask him to be the liaison uh, 
to the Flint Community Schools. The planning and development director position is currently open, and it may be that that person is a good fit for the liaison. Uh, until we get to the point where we can do that within our budget, then I'll continue to do everything I can personally to ensure that we have a strong relationship and a strong connection, uh, not only with the Flint schools, but with higher education and with our, our charter schools in our community. This, this is that important to me. Yes, yes, I will appoint a high-ranking official. We need a liaison person to talk, you know, to be there with the schools. We sure do, because that's how we're going to make things happen. And I, I want to be part of that discussion myself. But if you want schools to be, if you want neighborhoods to be the hubs for schools, then we need to start building our neighborhoods up. That's what we need to start doing. We can't just tear houses down and not put homes for people and families to live in. That's what we have to do if you want them to be hubs for schools. You don't just tear down, you build back up. You do things to keep people in neighborhoods that are close to schools. You do things to attract people to want to come to those neighborhoods. And also, you know, if you cared so much about the kids, well, you would have spoken up about the lead that's in the water. That's what you would have done. We've had kids that have gotten lead poisoning. They're going to have cognitive deficits, cognitive delays. They're going to have learning disabilities. They're going to need special education services. They're going to need mental health support and services. They're going to need all these kinds of things because you cared so much about the kids and you didn't speak up and speak out about the contaminated water. You know, so if you care so much about the kids, that's what you would have done. It's going to tax our school system. They don't have enough money as it is. We don't have enough mental health providers in the schools. We don't have enough school social workers and school psychologists already. We, you know, you're, you're putting a special needs child uh, in a family. And that's, that's taxing. That costs a lot. And when you have kids under the age of six, and many families have more than one child under the age of six, and now they have a special needs kid, but you care so much about the kids. You're, gonna, you're, you're taxing the schools. You're, taxing, you're putting kids in the juvenile justice system because of this lead that's been uh, going in their brain because you didn't speak up and speak out about the issues that we were concerned about when people were telling us their hair was falling out, when people said they had skin rashes. If I had gone to the doctor and reported this, the doctor would have done some more testing. So if you cared about kids, you would have spoken up about that. Will I provide? Yes, I sure will provide that. Um, that's one of the things that I've talked about. Um, collaborative strategies. Yeah, I sure will because I said that I wanted to have monthly. I wanted to have uh, monthly town hall meetings where we talk about these collaborative strategies. I love doing collaborative strategies in the schools, uh, and, and that's where we're going to talk about them. I, I want to, you know, I said I wanted to have this liaison person to talk about these things. One of the things that I do have experience in is collaborating with the schools, collaborating with organizations, collaborating with different agencies, and putting things in place that the schools need. If you look, uh, I don't know if people remember, but we had some things in place when we put B103 and, and CATS 312, and if you looked at what was at Cedar Street, those were collaborative things that we did. Um, and, and we need to report out on those. We need to be held accountable for those kinds of things. We put services in place that hadn't been in, in the city of Flint as far as you looked at some of those ADHD services that nobody had ever had before. You look at those services we did for autism. And yeah, we need to be held accountable and you need to have benchmarks and, 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 um, and, and report those on a regular basis, just like we should have been doing with our water. You have benchmarks, you test things, you report out, you let people know what you're doing, you make adjustments. So we'd be doing that on a regular basis. I, yes, I, I certainly will. Same question. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I'd be happy to work with uh, MFA, with uh, Flint School officials, uh, to work on reporting that out. Uh, quarterly town hall meetings is fine, or, or other formats work for me, um, because it does take a team approach. 
And to Candidate Weaver's last questions or comments about me not caring about the kids in this community, I find that deeply offensive. And I, and I hope that this community will look carefully at my record. And the fact that I brought the governor to the table to get us reconnected to Detroit. And I wish it would have happened sooner. But you have to look at actions, because actions speak a lot louder than words. And we said that Detroit needed to be an option for our community. And I've worked tirelessly to keep that in place, raising kids in this community. And our friends have kids in this community. But the good thing about our democratic process is Everyone gets a chance to go vote and gets to view the records of each of the two candidates. I've worked day and night through difficult times with the emergency manager. And if you don't see the Republican agenda in Lansing and how difficult that's made it for our community, I see that in my seat. I see us making progress. I see us getting dollars committed, getting switched back to Detroit, going to a long-term source that we can afford, and we're going to continue to work hard on education, on water, so that our kids really do have a future in this community. Thank you, Mayor Ross. We would like to ask everyone who's in the audience, if you could please be respectful to both candidates. We definitely want to hear what each of them have to say, and we want to be very respectful for the time that they provide We are pleased that the master planning process and its results have gained positive national attention. However, the true measure of the plan's success will be gaining the capital to implement and integrate with the evolving realities of community needs and challenges. Therefore, as a part of the master planning process, what do you see as infrastructure needs that should be integrated into all planning strategies going forward? And that goes you know, to Mayor Walker. We have a clear plan for rebuilding Flint's infrastructure. You may know that in addition to the adopted comprehensive plan, that part of that grant was for us to also develop the city's first combined capital improvement plan. That was adopted by the Planning Commission and the City Council. Uh, this is something that I promised when I came into office, that we would have a clear vision for our community, we'd have a plan, and we'd have everyone working on the same accord. And I'm proud of the work that we've done there, despite having some extraordinary challenges that have come our way here in the city of Flint. When you think about infrastructure and modern infrastructure, what we need in the 21st century, of course, it includes a secure drinking water system. We also need our sanitary sewers upgraded, our storm water system, plus we have the roads, street lights, sidewalks, trails, parks, community facilities, youth centers, all of these are covered in the capital improvement plan. We need a major upgrade all across the board. Just like we saw this community built out during the 20th century, we need to do that again in the 21st century. We also included blight elimination in our capital improvement plan because we recognize that we have to have clean and safe neighborhoods for our schools to be successful. It's not just about the bricks and mortar of a school or a youth center. It is about the neighborhood. And we've done a parcel survey of every property in the city of Flint. And we know the dollars we need to clean and clear the blight from our community and to make improvements across the board to all of our infrastructure systems. We can do this. We can create these diverse places across our city, our neighborhood business districts, a diverse set of neighborhoods. That's the vision we've adopted in the plan. And the capital improvement plan is guiding our budget process and guiding us to make smart, coordinated investments all across our city. Thank you, Mayor Warren. Same question, Dr. Weaver. Thank 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we've had thousands of Flint citizens have given input into the master plan, thousands, and the capital improvement plan. So I do, I want to respect their tireless efforts for that. I also have to say that I'm going to do everything in my power to implement their vision for the city. But one thing we have to remember is that the master plan is a living document. It's a living document, and it may need some amendments. You know, uh, I've talked with people. Some people have said that it hasn't been aggressive enough when you look at neighborhood stabilization and revitalization. We need to look closer at commercial and industrial businesses in the master plan. And some things have taken place since that master plan was written that, that had not happened when it was put in place. Now we have lead service pipelines that we need to take into account. So job number one would be to focus on improving our water source and our water distribution system. You know, so I want to make it clear. There's one credible voice tonight, and that's mine, Karen Weaver. I have not broken the trust of the people here. Uh, my opponent's failed leadership and broken trust led us to where we are today. High lead in water that cost way too much. You know, when we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about water, sewer, streets, sidewalks. So we have a lot, we have a lot of work to do. There, there's a lot because I said this before, we have never experienced anything like this. So I'm ready to get started. You know, um, we, like I said, we, we heard a lot as far as the cost, but I'm going to put my trust, I'm going to put my trust in the information gathered by Dr. Mark Edwards and his Virginia Tech research team. Uh, they gave us information before that was accurate, and so I'm going to go with what they, what they gave us. And they gave us an astronomical figure. They said something like almost $1.5 to replace every pipe in our water distribution center, and they were concerned. They were concerned because of the corrosive Flint River water, and it was eroding our water distribution piping system. And it was eroding it at a rate, you know, at a, at a fast rate. It was uh, three-fourths a year worth of erosion in one month. And what they were concerned about was if we continued to use this Flint River water, that it was going to totally destroy, it was going to totally destroy our, our already fragile uh, distribution lines within just a few short years. So, you know, it's estimated that we'll, it's going to require an additional what, $356 million to fully implement our capital improvement plan. So we, we, we need money. We've got to do something now. We need some funds. We need some funds to, to help get this fixed. That's what we have to do. That's what we're going to need, and I'm, I'm going to put my trust in them. Uh, they, they came through for us before. They gave us accurate information. They let us know where we stand on things. And so I'm going to, I'm going to trust what they told us again because they, they didn't have a dog in this fight. They were concerned about what was going on in Flint. And so they came and they researched and they did this because they cared, because they believed that they had an ethical and moral responsibility. And so I'm going to go with what they've told us. As I said, we, we do have serious infrastructure challenges across the, the whole board from underground, uh, starting with the water system, but this is also where you start to see the difference with experience, because every budget is about making choices around priorities. Yeah, anybody can say 600 miles of pipe in the Flint water distribution system would cost $1.5 billion to replace. What does that tell us about what we're going to do next summer? 
with the resources that we have. We've done that in our adopted capital improvement plan that both the Planning Commission and the Flint City Council have already adopted. Let's start with water. We know that over the next five years, we need $50 million in the highest priority projects that have been identified from pipe replacement to critical improvements at the water treatment system. And I had pledged a number of weeks ago that we needed the additional $10 million to get started on lead service line replacements, especially for our most vulnerable citizens. And I'll be asking the Planning Commission to make that adjustment in our capital improvement plan uh, this fall. Flint also has dedicated accounts for each of these different infrastructure areas. We're receiving Act 51 dollars from the state for roads. That's why it's so important that there be a change in Lansing with road funding so we actually have the money we need to make the road repairs that are critical. We have the public facilities 402 fund that we can use on city hall and community facilities, community development block grants that we've used to improve Burster and the Haskell Center and the Oak Business Center. So we have the ability to make changes. We're making those every year in our budget. It's been a cooperative effort. It's not just the city. It's also been grants and partners like the Friends of Burston who have come forward to help make that a first class youth center. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. The last question under this topic is what will you do to identify foundational state and federal funding sources? It starts with a plan, and, and our community has one. We should be incredibly proud of the work that we did with the President's Sustainable Communities Grant to create a vision for our community in the 21st century. It was just a few days ago that that plan was recognized by the Michigan Association of Planning as the best comprehensive plan in the state of Michigan. That gives us what we need to go to the US EPA to the governor's desk to seek funding from the financially distressed cities, townships, and villages fund. We are going to bring the dollars into this community based on a strong plan. We, we've got a long way to go because we didn't have a combined capital improvement plan when I came into office. We hadn't done the work. So that's when I say I'm asking people to look at my record and look at my experience. Because we've done things in the last few years that have moved our community forward despite incredibly difficult circumstances. The worst recession we have seen, a Republican takeover in Lansing, four different emergency managers. We've come a long way. And we've got a long, long way to go. But I've got the relationships with the White House. I've got the ability to get to the governor to bring him to the table, and I hope that, that you'll see and judge me based on those things that we have been able to accomplish in these difficult circumstances. Thank you. Okay, what I, I, I want to retain the best and the brightest grants writer. I want somebody that does municipal grants writing. Uh, for foundation, state and federal resources for our city. That's what we have to have. We need those kinds of resources to get out of the mess that we're in. That person's primary responsibility would be to identify and aggressively go after every available resource dollar because we need help. We need help now, we need money, and we need money now. But if we're going to talk about experience, I'll tell you one thing I don't have. Your experience, uh, I don't have the kind of experience you have because your experience is what got us an emergency manager. Your experience is what raised water rates illegally. Your experience is what got us lead in the water and you didn't speak up and speak out about it. Your experience told us that me and my family drink this water every single day. Well, if that's true, I hope you all went to the doctor to get your blood lead levels tested. That's what I hope you did. That's what your kind of experience got us. It got us in this mess that we're in. Yeah, the governor did some stuff too. Both of you did. And you passed the buck back and forth. So that's what the experience has gotten us. And I, I wish you'd call Obama and tell him to come on up here since you talk to him all the time. Tell him to come and, and give us some federal money. We, we need some help, and we need some help right now. 
The economy is really important, and we all know we need jobs in the city of Flint. So job generation, that will be at the core of my administration. That, that's the vision that I have. A Weaver administration will employ a, a multi-pronged attack, employer retention and employer att attraction, because I want a bird in the hand and a bird in the bush. That's what I want, because business attraction has to be balanced. It has to be balanced with business retention. We've got to do both of those things. You, you look at a business like Cooley Vending. Rand, Randy Cooley, that family's been in the city of Flint for 76 years. He's made a commitment to, to be here and to stay here. There's another one, Mary Taylor has, has done the same thing. So unlike the current administration, I want to place a priority on retaining community investors like these people that I just mentioned and others like them. That's one of the things I want to do. I'm a small business owner, so I understand the challenges that they face. I I'm aware of those kinds of things. So my administration, I'm going to advance a robust, a robust game plan to a attack job generation with a zeal and with a commitment that has seldom been witnessed at City Hall. That's what I want to do. I want to do, you know, um, traditional municipal service as well. You know, the best way to, to retain and attract is to have efficient delivery of basic city services. We need fire and police to be able to respond quickly. We need timely inspections for buildings. We need waste collection. We need snow removal. You know, we're talking about the schools and what we need to do. Kids need to be able to get out and get to school. Parents need to be able to get out and get to work. Those are some of the things we need to do. We need our, you know, street lights. We need, that's how we're going to get businesses and keep businesses, is have efficient basic city services. Lord knows not having the worst water in the country and the highest rates, that's not going to help us. Same question here, Lauren. We know that the, the foundation for our success for the opportunities that we want our, our kids and grandkids to have here in Flint in the 21st century is a diverse economy. It's a diverse economy that has good paying jobs. So that's what I've worked very hard with a, a whole team, whether it's the Flint and Genesee Chamber or the Federal Department of Commerce. We've worked with, with everyone who's been prepared to invest in this community. And I, I know that it's been a slow recovery. When I came into office, we were at the bottom of the worst recession this country had ever seen. We had 30% unemployment in the city of Flint. And we've been able to make some great progress. We've seen billions of dollars in investment from General Motors. And you know, we know what General Motors chooses to do when there's not a cooperative approach. When there's a cooperative approach where people can sit down and respect each other across the table, then you can see serious investment, long-term investments. Flint's going to be part of the rebirth of American manufacturing. We're going to build on that base to have neighborhood business centers again and not have all of our retail out in the rest of the county. But it takes an attitude of respect and the kind of personal attacks that I've heard up here tonight from my opponent, Candidate Weaver, attacking my, my family, and my kids? How, how's that going to be received by business leaders, by General Motors, and the people that we need to move this community forward? We're going to work on every one of those fronts. We've seen more than a thousand jobs retained or created every year since the bottom of that recession in 2009. And I'm confident that if we're working together, we're going to see more and more gains in the coming years. Hey, next 
question. Specifically, what measures will you pursue to attract opportunities for residents in your game and for your world? This is what I meant about you, you need a diverse economy and then you have to have good paying jobs. And the pathway for everyone in our community to have employment is to build the skills of our workforce. Th that's why community education is so critical because we need a workforce that's highly skilled, that's educated, and that's engaged. And through that, we know that we'll be able to attract more high growth companies. I'm very proud of the work we did to keep Diplomat Specialty Pharmacy in this community. They moved in in December 2010 with 200 jobs. They now have 1,200 people going to work there. That's generating a lot of jobs for people right here in Flint. The American Pipe Factory that moved into the north end of the Buick City Complex, north of Stewart. I walked the factory floor with the company owners, and I've seen the people in Flint who have found gainful employment. So we've got to have that pathway. It starts with having skills, creating a climate that supports our, our high growth companies, and then giving everyone a second chance. Because a, a big part of what our out of work men and women in this community need is a second chance. And that's why I pledged to be a part of the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative and why I've supported innovative state approaches like the Community Ventures Program that's helped put hundreds of people in this community to work who had barriers to employment. Every good paying job in this community supports a family. It improves our neighborhoods and it makes our community stronger. Job by job, company by company, worker by worker, that's the approach we're taking. It's working. And if we continue on this path, I see a really bright future for our community. Dr. Weaver. I'm, I'm going to say some of the things that I just said, because if we want to uh, have jobs, we, we've got to take care of home. We've got to do some things right here to clean up our city and to address some of the issues and the challenges that we're facing. And that's why I was talking about having uh, municipal services, quality municipal services. That's why I talked about that. The infrastructure work that we're going to need, that's going to create some new jobs for local residents, whether it's with the water, the sewer, the streets, the sidewalks. We know we've got some infrastructure issues, so we're gonna have a lot of work right there. But we do, we, we've gotta have our traditional services in place if we wanna keep people here, if we wanna bring people here. Um, I can't say that enough, efficient delivery of basic city services. But one of the things I want to say is I didn't attack your family. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was standing up for them when I said we need to go back to Detroit, and I said it a long time ago, when we said there was something wrong with the water. That's not an attack on your family or any family. That's a way to speak up for the families because we needed, we needed some help. We needed somebody to address the issue that was of most concern to the residents of the city of Flint. If we're killing ourselves with water, we can't do any of these other things. We can't do any of these other things. So that wasn't a, an attack on your family. I spoke, and I, I spoke up and I spoke out on behalf of all uh, the citizens of the city of Flint. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist by training. I have an ethical and moral, moral responsibility to do that. And that's what I did. And that's what the medical community did. We spoke up and we spoke out. So if, if speaking out about having clean water is an attack on your family or anybody else's, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. So I just, I just want to clear that up. That was not an attack on your family. Final. It was speaking up for your family. Final to us. We believe today you have made a public commitment to the direction your administration will take. And therefore, we will, within the first 630 days of your election to the mayor's office, come to a town hall meeting and sign a document reaffirming the elements of this evening's commitment. Do you believe that you have made it? Right? Dr. Weaver? Yes. Yes. Thank you.
Yes, I want everybody to hear me as well. Yes, I will. Mayor Wall. Yes. Okay. And, and we have to record it, so I can make up any of it. We have to record it. I just want you to know that it's recorded. So at this time, we would like you to take two minutes to just summarize your thoughts for tonight. Any last words you would like to say to the audience that's here today? And Dr. Mayor Wall, you begin first. Well, thank you again for all coming, being part of this dialogue to the sponsors and to St. Michael's for hosting us. Uh, this is a critical time for our community. And I have the you know, passion and the determination to continue to drive this city forward. It's an incredibly difficult job. And, and you all know that we've been through some terribly difficult times. We've got a strong plan. We've got the experience, the relationships, and we're going to make the progress that this community wants to see. You all know that a lot of what my opponent has said here tonight are things that are already underway, have been worked on for a long time. That doesn't change that there's a lot of hard work that we still have to do, but we're going to continue that work because there's so much riding on what we're doing. And those actions, they do speak louder than words. I've been there through the emergency managers. I know the kind of agenda that we're up against in Lansing. I understand what the president's up against in Congress and how hard it is to get the money we need, but we're going to work tirelessly. We're going to see success. We've got a great plan. We're working together as a team. And I'll commit as I've always done, to listen to this community, to make decisions in the best interest of the community, and to do everything we can for Flint to have this future in the 21st century that we all want for ourselves, that I want for my kids, thank you, and that we want for all of Flint's children. I, I, I too want to thank the sponsors for hosting this, this forum this evening, and I want to thank you all for coming out this evening to hear our views and our opinions about how we see moving the city of Flint forward. Uh, I decided to run for mayor because we are at a crossroads. We've had broken trust and we've had failed leadership, and uh, we can't afford another four years of this administration. We simply cannot afford it. So I'm, I'm asking for your support in helping me make change. I, I'm asking uh, for your prayers. I need your vote. I need your support. Flint deserves better. And together, I know we can do this. So November 3rd, I'd like you to come out. Come out strong in big numbers. Take your family, take your friends, take your neighbors to the polls. If you're not going to be here, vote absentee, but get out and vote. That's how we make change happen. That's how we see Flint move in the direction we'd like to see it move in. I know that together we can do this, and I just want to say uh, thank you, God bless you, and God bless Flint. Thank you, Dr. Okay, as we close tonight, we have from the city of Flint, uh, general election absentee ballot. If you want one, you free to take one. I think we're going to give both of our candidates a round of applause. Uh, also, uh, I would admonish you to do your research. Find out. Don't, don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody. Don't take any other one person. But don't take a word. But do your research. And then make your decisions. Okay? So the thing is that I want to thank you so much tonight. Be safe. And let's work to make Flint uh, a great place. Before you leave, we're going to have a closing prayer. And I ask Pastor Dave Bell, a peace pastor here. Yeah, we have a few more. We do. We do.
thank you both for coming. I really do appreciate it. Um, before I pray, I'm going to ask one question here. Um, I'd like to see all the people who are going to vote in the election to stand up. If you come to this thing, and you don't vote, yeah, first, better you stand up. Very good. Very good. While you're standing, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for St. Michael's for bringing us to here and, and letting us uh, use this facility. We thank you for your blessing and we thank you for putting your hand We know this is a hard thing for both of them to do. It's a hard walk. It's tiring, it's difficult, it's exhausting. We just pray that you bless us each and both during this campaign. Pray that you with everyone who's come out tonight. We're thankful that they did come. And I pray that you bless them as well. I pray that you see everyone here. Be with us all. Be a safe and home. So that's our prayer. That's the Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.